to present this topic to the resident community. The slides are going to be a little intimidating because I wanted to share as much um, explanation and reference as possible. But since we're recording it now, you know, you can always go back to look at everything. I've tried to reference everything um, and it's in ways that you can just kind of copy and paste what I put on the slide and find it immediately in PubMed. Uh, so, right. So focus on the pictures and what I tell you rather than getting lost in the slide. My goal is to give you a solid foundation of the anatomical and electrodiagnostic underpinnings that inform the latest clinical evidence for diagnosing and managing radiculopathy. And like I said, feel free to in interrupt. So my name is Gautam Malhotra. I work full time at the VA and enjoy a part time private practice. I'm a graduate of this very same program where I am now a clinical associate professor actively teaching at the bedside and giving didactics of general physiatry and electrodiagnostic principles. I genuinely love helping and meeting people. Feel free to reach out to me uh, with any questions anytime. I also love mentoring uh, and helping connect people with job opportunities. My wife is actually a uh, passionate lawyer in terms of trying to protect physicians in their contract negotiation. I think one of your chiefs may have reached out to her. Um, and I think she lectured you guys last year. She did, so, yeah. She was a very good lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Norbury said that was the one that uh, you guys uh, stayed awake most for. So yeah. definitely not my motor neuron. Definitely yeah. not my motor neuron this year to talk. It's um, <laughs> a very good right. one. <laughs> but I'd be happy to come back and give you whatever topics you'd like. Um, this presentation is about radiculopathy. There are many challenges to learning this topic that I address along the way in this lecture. So let's get one thing that silently frustrates many physiatrists out in the open right away. What does the word radiculopathy actually mean? Technically, it's pathology of the nerve root. But in my experience, the term radiculopathy can mean many different things to different people, depending on the implied context. You may hear people refer to it as a clinical diagnosis or a definitive syndrome with a pattern of signs and symptoms. They could mean a specific etiology, such as a pinched nerve or a disc. They could be talking about a specific pattern of electrodiagnostic findings or imaging findings. My personal pet peeve is when it is used to refer <laughs> to a specific region, pattern, or distribution. For example, if my resident says that the patient complained of a radicular pain pattern, to me, that implies certainty of a pathological diagnosis. So I'll ask them to be more descriptive, such as saying, well, they have neck pain radiating through the shoulders into the second digit. Um, this crotchety old man will show up every now and then. Um, the, the last re relevant academic caveat to share right now is that there is no gold standard for this diagnosis like there are for other diseases. If you read enough of the literature, you'll see that diagnostic techniques are compared to each other intraoperative findings or even clinical presentations. So hopefully I have clarified some of these things for you rather than just sound like the crotchety old man in the slide. But with those caveats out of the way, we can now discuss the condition the way it generally is with as much specific clarity as possible. Since this is an anatomical injury, let's go over the relevant anatomy to ensure we're all on the same page. As you know, neurons are cells serving as the structural and functional units of the nervous system, sending messages from one part of the body to another. Structurally speaking, the majority that physiatrists deal with are multipolar. Uh, first time using this uh, laser pointer, so it's pretty cool for me. Uh, so multipolar, which have variably branched processes projecting in many directions for diversified input. Uh, and it gets integrated into the cell body. Bipolar, these are seen in sensory organs like the eye and nose, and unipolars are in invertebrates. Uh, but please take note um, of the pseudo unipolar neurons, and those of you going into injectology will appreciate this. They have two processes which fuse uh, during development into one short common axon right here, which splits into one branch that terminates in the periphery and the second branch heads to the spinal cord. This way stimuli from the periphery bypass the cell body and reach the axon terminal without delay. And we'll get back to this. If we look at the nervous system as being the central and peripheral systems, then everything that's not spinal cord or brain is peripheral. A bundle of nerve fibers conveying impulses between different parts of the body are called roots, nerves, or rami, depending upon where they are. I know, very basic, but I just want to make sure the R1s are in the same place as the R3s. If you slice a nerve, you'll see that it has a skin or epineurium. 
Inside are bundles or fascicles surrounded by connective tissue called perineurium. The bundled axons are themselves surrounded by a matrix called endoneurium. And I have some extra stuff here for you later if you want it. So here we see the rootlets extending from the spinal cord and coalescing to form the roots. So these are rootlets here, about 12 to 16 at each level, and they coalesce to form a root. And these are the roots, as you can see. Here, maybe it's easier to see the ventral. Here's the dorsal. Uh, wherever this happens, we call it a spinal level, such as C7 level. The ventral root joins the thickening of the dorsal root, which is called the dorsal root ganglion, and that forms the piddly little spinal nerve. Notice that the dorsal root ganglion is essentially sitting within the neuroforamen. Let's deviate to pathophysiology for a moment. Although you're probably aware, the electrodiagnostic evaluation of radiculopathy requires an understanding of what happens when a neuron is damaged. There are two types of damage to nerves that are relevant to radiculopathy. Demyelination is the preferential injury to a segment of the myelin sheath where conduction will be affected. Remyelination can occur, but it'll be with shorter internodal lengths. And, but even though that happens and maybe you're slower across that segment, function is completely restored. If the cell body is affected, then the entire cell dies and disintegrates. If, the, if only the axon is damaged, then the Schwann cells and axon around the injured segment degenerate in addition to everything distal from there to the end organ. Eventually, regeneration can occur if there's a clear path to the end organ, meaning there's an endoneurium that's intact. This is pretty straightforward for the motor neuron sitting in the ventral root, uh, but it's a different story for the pseudo unipolar axon sitting in the dorsal root. As you can see here, only one projection, sorry, I just got a notification from my boss. Right, here only one projection degenerates while the other one um, is basically remaining intact, right? So if you were to test this degenerated segment, it would be abnormal. But if you test the intact segment, it would appear to be normal, right? So that doesn't mean the person isn't howling in pain. It's just that if you test this, this seems normal. Yep, again with the, there we go. So let's apply this and review the relevant anatomy now. The two keys to this are to remember that the locations of cell bodies are different for motor neurons and sensory neurons. If the black line demarcates site of injury, Wallerian degeneration eventually occurs distal to the lesion in relation to the cell body when an axon is damaged. As you can see, the de degeneration will proceed peripherally this way. You see a dotted line here? It'll proceed per uh, peripherally when the ventral root is damaged. However, the degeneration occurs centrally when the dorsal root is affected. This location of dorsal root damage is described as preganglionic for this reason. This leaves the peripheral sensory axons intact and your sensory studies will be normal despite the patient clinically howling in pain and numb in that dermatome. Returning to our discussion of anatomy, notice that this now is, oh, I keep getting notifications from teams, I'm sorry. This now, um, is called the spinal nerve right here, right? And it's mixed. It's got um, uh, sensory uh, afferent and efferent, whereas the afferent is here and the efferent is here, this is mixed. And you have a dorsal ramus and a ventral primary ramus, okay? So I felt so proud of these drawing abilities I had and later found the exact same thing on Google later. So um, you can find it on Google. The spinal nerve divides into a ventral and dorsal primary ramus. You can see it here. So this is the ventral ramus and this is the dorsal primary ramus. And you need to know this anatomy. Um, this is happening just distal to the neuroforamen. Electrodiagnostic and inter interventional spine procedures require understanding this anatomy. So you may have heard of medial branch blocks. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, well, this is that medial branch. And it's the medial branch of the dorsal ramus, which not surprisingly branches medially, 
to supply the deep pain generating structures like discs, ligaments, facets, while the lateral branch um, is uh, handling superficial muscles and skin on the back. And then the ventral rami go on to be uh, everything else like plexuses and uh, um, peripheral nerves. So I just wanted to take a moment to clarify the numbering of nerves as, the, as they exit the spine. So PGY2s, you may have got, gotten confused every now and then. So this is how I pictured it when I first started. So cervical roots and nerves sit on the lower vertebrae, sit on, I'm saying. So if you look between, um, let's say here, this is from a neurosurgery text, this is Netter. So if you look between C3 and four, over here, you don't see a nerve, but you see it, uh, let's say it's, uh, let's say it's this one. You see how it looks like it's sitting on this cervical vertebrae? So vertebra, so to me, it belongs to that vertebra. So between C3 and four, it's gonna belong to C4. So therefore it's a C4 nerve root. So the nerve between C5 and six would be C6. The nerve between C6 and seven would be C7. And this is the last level where this rule applies. A funny thing happens below C7 vertebra. The nerve is named C8, even though there is no C8 vertebra. So C8 roots exit below the C7 vertebra and just above T1. Thus all thoracic and lumbar nerves come out below their respective vertebrae. So the way I picture it with um, lumbar is if you look at a, a lumbar MRI sagittally, you'll see that the nerve seems to belong to the one up top. So here's L3, here's L4. So this would be the L3, four disc space, whoops. But the L3, but the nerve is called L3 and it belongs to the one above. If this helps you, great. If not, use your own technique. So you're going to see that there's a whole bunch of um, questions, uh, multiple choice questions that basically just need you to understand the anatomy. So in this one, they're asking the muscle pair most likely to receive a significant portion of its innervation from C7 is. So there's no way around it. You just have to memorize two ner nerve roots per muscle, except the rhomboids. And when you write, when you do these questions, I would write the, the roots above each muscle just so you don't get confused. And it's pretty straightforward. So which of the following muscles is usually innervated by two different nerves? Which muscle is frequently supplied by a single spinal root level? These are all taken from prior exams. So what can cause a radiculopathy? Well, let's talk about the fact that it can be mechanical versus chemical uh, irritation. And that means compression versus inflammation. So the most common things you're gonna see are intraver in intervertebral disc pathology, herniated nucleus pulposus. Um, unfortunately, you may also see cancer, neoplastic disease, infections like discitis, and metabolic issues such as diabetes. By now you should know that intervertebral discs have two components. They have a tough outer annulus fibrosis, and they have the nucleus pulposus inside. Although it may not be 100% accurate, my patients connect with me relating these discs to jelly donuts. The jelly can sometimes squirt out. Based on the online images for clinicians offering injections and surgeries, it's really scary if there's a jelly squirting out, right? Right, look at these. Oh my God, please give me surgery. Well, unfortunately, no one tells them the jelly is constantly squirting out in all of us. I've reviewed almost 100 scientific studies at this point that show a significant number of disc herniations in asymptomatic patients. That means you MRI someone with no pain and there's a likelihood of seeing a disc herniation. The percentages to make things easy are about the same as the age. So 20% of people in their 20s will have disc herniation, 30% in their 30s, all the way up to 80% in their 80s. One study actually found 90% in their 20s, but that was a military population. I think this is important for patients to hear so that they don't fixate on the MRI findings, which unfortunately happens when they meet a surgeon. So on the MRI, there are different categories of disc herniations, which are important for you to know because they carry different clinical prognoses. The verbiage is now standardized by a giant task force and used by everyone the same way after decades of clinicians arbitrarily using various words to describe what they saw. 
Protrusion is when the jelly hasn't made it out of the dough. Extrusion is when it has. And sequestration is when it's lost connection to the parent disc. Disc protrusion is common and prevalence increases from 29% of those 20 years of age to 43% of those 80 years of age. They are also seen in 50% of women in childbearing age. X-ray can show loss of disc height and spondylosis. Here's a smaller disc space suggesting loss of jelly over the years. Here's a herniation on sagittal and axial MRI. MRI is an excellent means of identifying structural issues that may cause radiculopathy, such as herniated nucleus pulposus, spinal tumors, severe spinal stenosis at the neck or back, or other mass lesions. Lumbar disc herniation can regress or disappear spontaneously without surgical intervention. Let me say that again. Lumbar disc herniation can regress or disappear spontaneously without surgical intervention. There's three theories of how this happens. One, the donut sucks the jelly back in. Two, the jelly dehydrates. Or what's probably happening is that the body gobbles it up. And it's interesting because the worse the herniation, the better the chances it'll disappear. I'm going to turn this around now. Let's look at what normally comes to clinic. Literally, this is what Google gave me when I looked for normal cervical MRI, spine, normal, normal cervical spine MRI. So can there be a radiculopathy in this setting? Uh, just nod. Yeah, some people saying yes, because you know that's good roundsmanship. Okay, elephants in the room. The first is for clinicians and the word radiculitis. Is that such a thing? Well, there is excellent research showing that nucleus pulposus causes inflammatory markers and cascades, which likely contribute to the pain seen with disc herniations. And this is in contrast to what we used to attribute it to, mechanical compression. So although I don't use the word in my reports, my electrodiagnostic reports, radiculitis is a real thing, and it justifies the various steroid injections performed in this context. The second elephant in the room is how funny the word radiculopathy sounds to our patients, and I'm, I'm too old for you guys, but you know, I couldn't help myself. I had to reference this late 80s sitcom we used to walk called Perfect Strangers, where fresh off the boat, Belki Bartokamus would say, of course not, don't be ridiculous. But, you know, with my patients, I'll, I'll say radiculopathy. And if they look at me funny, I'll say, and it's a ridiculous word. And they love that. Um, yeah. But just to summarize, the gray areas I've shared, you can have asymptomatic disc herniations on MRI, and you can have symptoms due to chemical radiculitis, even if the disc doesn't look bad. So, you know, there's no slam dunks here. Having addressed disc herniations, let's hit the other common cause of radiculopathy, which is DJD of the spine. Although some textbooks do point out a distinction, most people equate spondylosis and spine osteoarthritis. Very often these changes are seen in asymptomatic spines, which suggests that it may be a normal part of the aging process. Regardless, really, it's the proliferative component that's relevant here. To demonstrate, I'm sharing a less common depiction of a spine segment from a neurosurgery textbook showing the facet and uncovertebral joints adjacent to the neuroforamen. See, here's the neuroforamen, here is the uncovertebral joint, and here's the facet. You can imagine how proliferative spurring at these two locations could stenose the foramen where the nerve would be present. So this brings us to spinal stenosis, which, uh-oh, looks like I'm the crotchety old guy again. The word stenosis means a smaller diameter, but the problem, like with the word radiculopathy, is that we don't always mean the same thing when we use this term. It can refer to anatomic findings seen on imaging, but I hear people referring to it as a syndrome or even a pattern of electrodiagnostic findings. So I tried to clarify some of the terminology with this slide. When talking about spinal stenosis, it can be of congenital or acquired etiology. It can also be central or lateral, when it's lateral, there are zones that can be identified uh, to further detail it. The syndrome is the unfortunate um, neurogenic claudication that comes from a complex set of contributing factors. It's a lot more complicated than just, oh, it's getting squeezed there. There's much more going on to explain spinal stenosis symptoms. I've now shared the evidence out there that says disc herniations and degenerative spinal stenosis are common in the asymptomatic population. And all of this stuff just keeps adding on every decade you get older. 
Multiple studies have shown that these are not associated with disability or back pain severity. So I essentially tell my patients, seeing this stuff could be thought of as gray hair and wrinkles. It requires clinical correlation. This is why multiple professional organizations have strong positions against imaging for back pain. It doesn't really help. Our patients are fixated on their imaging findings because their surgeons are fixated on them. The reasons the surgeons are fixated on them is that it determines which surgical procedures they can offer. And surgeons offer surgery. I tell patients very honestly, no matter how smart and compassionate your surgeon is, when you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So we've re covered relevant neuroanatomy, neurohistology, pathophysiology, and the very gray area subjects of imaging in disc herniations and stenosis. Okay, so the board relevant epidemiology takeaways are essentially these. Radiculopathy is not super common when comparing it to other things we treat like OA, CTS, or rotator cuff disease. C7 and L5 are still officially the most common levels involved. And it seems to affect men slightly earlier and slightly more commonly. And that's all I have to say for epidemiology. The typical patient with cervical or, or lumbosacral radiculopathy will present with axial spine pain that also has some component of extension into a limb. Many of you will concur that it's usually a deep, poorly localized aching in the shoulder or buttock, and some believe this may suggest a scleroton sclerotomal association. I'll usually have them point to where it hurts, and um, if palpation hurts them, eh, it's time to think about more of a musculoskeletal differential. There can be seemingly neuropathic symptoms of paresthesias, weakness, and numbness, which may reflect neural uh, hypo or hyperactivity. You hope these will be dermatomal and myotomal, but most patients will not be able to localize with that kind of specificity. Regarding weakness, they'll tell you about functional deficits, such as inability to stand on tiptoes, catching their foot, or inability to remove their shoe. The time course might tell you something about, hey, is it etio uh, the etiology? Maybe it's an abrupt onset of a disc herniation or slow worsening, maybe more consistent with a spinal stenosis. Anyway, all of these symptoms have low sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing a radiculopathy, but you still have to ask all this stuff. To make matters worse, other things can look dermatomal when they present to our clinics as seen here with sclerotomal and facet mediated patterns, which you may confuse for radic. For the junior residents, some of, these, this, some of this may be new to you, but you can get fooled by referral patterns emanating from the guts, discs, and muscle. And you know your attending is nodding her head. Yep, see this all day long. First of all, just accept that it's not fair. They make us memorize anatomy and rules that just may not apply to a real human body. Cadaver studies have established that deviations from accepted cervical root and brachial plexus anatomy can be found in every case. Many times the dorsal root ganglion is sitting inside the canal instead of the foramen. And whenever needle EMG couldn't confirm L5 versus S1, it was likely due to variable innervation. The conus causes all sorts of electrodiagnostic interpretation issues when involved. And finally, all of you should know that the dermatomes we learn are just estimations. In fact, one study injecting roots at various levels found a variation from the dermatomes and even side to side differences within the same person. So how about the exam? Definitely perform your screening physiatric exam, which should include neuromuscular and musculoskeletal components. Although abnormal neuro exam findings are better for predicting who would have a radiculopathy on EMG, many patients with normal examinations have abnormal needle EMG studies, indicating that clinicians should not neglect to perform EDX testing simply because the physical examination is normal. And this was alluded to in uh, Dr. Kadaba's uh, ultrasound Thing, that there's people presenting with symptoms and you don't see anything on EMG, but you might see something on ultrasound. You know, So there's more, as we get deeper and deeper, there may be more ways to confirm these um, people who have no exam findings. So it's remarkable that despite their wide use in clinical practice, there's no or little evidence, I'll say, to support their accuracy. These provocative tests, there's no universally accepted diagnostic criteria, so it's not clear what a positive test actually measures. But do I do them? Yes, I do them all. 
you need to look for other things on the differential, carpal tunnel, rotator cuff, piriformis. Clinically, interestingly, the prevalence of musculoskeletal findings are higher when EMG is going to be normal than when radic is found on EMG. So if your MSK, if you have MSK findings, it's more likely that you will see a normal EMG than if they do have EMG findings on radic. This is all evidence-based. So let's move to electrodiagnostic testing for a suspected radiculopathy. Besides confirming clinical suspicion that someone has a radic, it addresses the differential and guides other diagnostic testing and imaging. Later, we'll talk about prognosis and treatment. So as you know, electrodiagnostic medicine involves a composite assessment composed of various tests. Nerve conduction studies are done to basically rule out other stuff. Overall, needle EMG has modest sensitivity and excellent specificity for radiculopathy. I've included AANEM's Choosing Widely document to address areas based on the greatest potential for overuse or misuse, as well as relevance for quality improvement. And these were supported for strong evidence-based research um, literature. But I just want to say the thing about the modest sensitivity and um, uh, excellent specificity. What I say to my patients is, you know, you may have it and I may not have found it, but if I found it, that's what it is. And they seem to like that. So here's a reminder of Valerian degeneration affecting one of the axons projecting from the dorsal root, but no issues with the other axon. So let's just finish up the clinical practical aspects of nerve conductions. Now, nerve conduction studies in single root radiculopathy are definitely, usually, going to be normal. The next slide explains this if you haven't thought about it before. So if nerve conduction studies are normal in radic, why bother with them? Essentially, you're doing them to rule out other things. Since 2005, I've been testing the sural sensory and peroneal motor nerves as the optimal way to screen for distal symmetric polyneuropathy. These two studies, by the way, are almost always normal in lumbosacral radic. So if you do a sural and peroneal, per that 2005 consensus statement, no matter what else you find on electrodiagnostic testing, they do not, you can't show that they have a typical distal symmetric peripheral polyneuropathy per their definition for clinical research. And the other thing they're saying here is that it's almost always, those two are almost always normal in radic. So if you find them to be normal, it's still not going against radic. You may have to chew on that for a little while. So this was taken from the ABPMR website. And I wanna prove a point here. Which nerve conduction finding would be expected in a C-sex radic. Based on what I just told you, the answer should be immediately obvious. There's too much noise on the screen. Yeah, go ahead, Vikram. C, he says C. Exactly, I just told you that sensories are normal. So why are sensories normal in single root radic? Well, not just sensories, steam apps are normal. Why? The SNAP will be unaffected. We just talked about Wallerian degeneration occurring proximal to the DRG, so your SNAP amplitude will be normal because you're measuring the normal axon. It could be too soon. Wallerian degeneration may not have occurred yet, and so you're not seeing any loss of amplitude. It could be too late. In motor, collateral sprouting may have kept pace with axonal loss. Uh, every muscle is duly innervated except for the rhomboids. So let's say it's an L5 radic and S1 is intact. Your CMAP, your CMAP amplitude may be within normal limits for that reason. And uh, finally, we only perform nerve conduction studies in the hand and foot. So they have to be either CAT1 um, to affect the CMAPs or L5S1 to be affecting CMAPs in the foot. So these are all the reasons why a single root radiculopathy would have normal um, nerve conduction studies. And that's right out of Wilborn, Sarah. For completeness, I'll address late responses. These are the long pathways, and radics only affect a relatively small part of it. So any issue along it could cause abnormalities, and they have lower utility in radiculopathy. The H-reflex <clears throat> 
has modest sensitivities and isn't always present in healthy subjects. It's the electrical version of the monosynaptic Achilles reflex and may help with distinguishing L5 versus S1. F waves have low sensitivities and low specificities and are not helpful for a dick. They're better as a screen for polyneuropathy. I've included this general table and there's a bunch of bonus slides for those of you less comfortable with the topic. Now I'm going to drive th this concept home with actual MCQs. These are recent AANEM SAE questions. I highly recommend joining the AANEM if you haven't already, because they're really good to residents and fellows. Lots of free stuff for you guys, opportunities and access to the big wigs um, for you as compared to the other organizations. So you have a 56 year old male with a C5, C8 cervical cord infarction. They'd most likely have normal, Vikram, just turn yours on because you're the first guy on my screen. Oh. Uh, Don't think too hard. This is C. C, normal sensories. Which study is the most helpful in differentiating a problem in, in the brachial plexus from the cervical nerve? A. Yes, sensories. Uh, which of the following studies is most likely to be normal in an S1 redic? A. Yep, the so sensories will be normal. Which study would be most helpful in differentiating a brachial plexus lesion from the nerve root avulsion? C. C. Which statement explains why the sensory nerve action potential is usually unaffected with the typical compressive radiculopathy? Uh, C. Yep. Very good. Sometimes there'll be H reflex questions. Sometimes there'll be distractors. This is actually an ethics question, but I think I've driven home the point. So let's talk about needle EMG. For the juniors who may not be familiar with this, it's a technique that requires looking at various parameters of the electrical discharges on a screen when the needle electrode is moved within a muscle. I have some bonus slides for you at the, um, uh, on this at the end, which you can look at. So this is the crux of it. Needle EMG confirms radiculopathy if you find abnormalities in two or more muscles innervated by the same root and different peripheral nerves, yet the muscles innervated by adjacent nerve roots are normal. And really you need to find fibrillations. If you do, you get a specificity of 100%. And ideally this should be in two limb muscles and paraspinals, but it's fine if it's only one limb and one paraspinal or just two limb muscles meeting criteria. What might be helpful is hearing that the evidence is full of reasons to perform needle EMG when a radiculopathy is suspected. Abnormalities on EMG is associated with statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvements in disability, prognosis, and response to treatment outcomes. These are true for PT, injections, and surgery. And I've given you multiple sources to prove that. What am I saying? If you find it on EMG, better prognosis. How awesome is that? So you're saying, sign me up. What do I need to do to find uh, on EMG for these favorable outcomes? If you focus on fibrillation potentials and positive sharp waves and complex repetitive discharges in a myotomal distribution over the softer stuff, you'll optimize your specificity to 100% for radiculopathy. So if you see someone calling radiculopathy because they saw a couple of polyphasics and maybe the amplitudes were funny and that's it, I don't know. That better be one of our gods of EMG saying it. So how many muscles should I needle before ruling out a radiculopathy? Does anyone know the answer? Okay, based on extensive study of the topic, Dr. Dillingham's group has compelling evidence to support six muscles where one is the paraspinals. Without paraspinals, it has to be eight limb muscles to reach the same sensitivity. So when I learned this, I was really kind of ticked off because I don't like going to the paraspinals in old people. But, you know, if, if I'm willing to do eight muscles in the limb, then I'm good. But if I'm not, I'd better do paraspinals as one of the six. Here's the simplified algorithm that says the same thing. Timeline is important to keep in mind, and I've tried to stuff all the relevant points into one slide. The main points are the timing of Wallerian degeneration and subsequent collateral sprouting, which will make your fibs disappear. Dr. Kraft demonstrated that fibs can get smaller over time as the muscle atrophies. And there is some controversy about the timing of appearance of uh, fibrillations from proximal to distal. I would avoid mentioning this based on what I've read though. And you know, it still gets taught, so 
Some caveats about fibs. They can be tough to find if the axon loss doesn't outpace active collateral sprouting. You won't see fibs if it's a pure sensory radiculopathy, duh. Then there are times when you may not wanna hang your hat on observed fibs. We know that direct muscle injury can cause persistence fibs for a year. And you can see them routinely with upper motor neuron disorders like stroke and SCI. Isn't that rocking your world a little? Also just make sure that what you're looking at is actually a fib and not a cleverly disguised MUAP. And there's studies that have shown people mistaken them. Once you've confirmed your suspicion of a radiculopathy, what do you wanna do? Well, if there were no red flags encountered, you wanna address with aggressive therapy. Plenty of studies have shown excellent recovery and return to work with these treatments when there's electrodiagnostic evidence paired with imaging of herniation. How about, uh, how about meds? NSAIDs, eh, they don't really have strong supporting evidence, but they're still called first line agent for PRN pain relief. Uh, opioids have even worse support than NSAIDs, and the official guidelines say pregabalin is not helpful. So the literature for meds is uh, meh at best. But physiatrists and exercise, we have strong supportive evidence in the favorable management of radiculopathy. As a physiatrist, you should be able to tailor your prescription to the diagnosis and the individual patient beyond evaluate and treat if asked on the oral boards. I have a bonus slide with some ideas for those of you who are less confident. So if meds are meh, then what about surgery? The 2006 JAMA sport trial is valuable in revealing that they will all eventually do just as well without surgery as they do with surgery, without any of the messy complications that come with being surgerized. Some exceptions exist where surgery should be considered. I've included the general surgical options, so you have some sense of what they do in the OR, but open discectomy is still gold standard since the 1940s, no matter how sexy the marketing for other procedures seem to be. As a physiatrist, I do everything possible to keep my patients away from surgeons, but I will refer immediately if I see any of these red flag signs, and so should you, and this is why you're asking them on your review of systems. To really drive home these urgent issues, this is the stuff that should already have been adequately addressed by a surgeon before they see me. This shows you unstable fractures of different kinds, deadly disc infections, and unstable vertebral motion, all of which I've seen and referred immediately for surgical eval. I hope that satisfies you, Patrick. Okay. What happens Dr. when you, uh, yeah. Dr. Malhotra, uh, I think what we'll do maybe is that we'll probably go for another couple of minutes. And I only have five more minutes left. So sounds we're good. Done. What happens when you see this? Um, for decades, this was my reaction because we know that cervical spine cord and spinal cord injury in the elderly are usually in the context of pre-existing spinal stenosis, right? When you're on your SCI rotations, they tell you, that this guy had a cervical myelopathy because of, or SCI because he had a like spinal stenosis. So does that mean all of these, you know, should be proactively surgically addressed? Well, if you talk to 10 spine surgeons, nine of them will say yes. The one academic evidence-based conservative surgeon will say only if symptomatic myelopathy. So the answer is find yourself such a surgeon in the community and refer to her for close follow-up over the years if asymptomatic. The literature is very helpful about this topic. If you see a central stenosis with radicular symptoms and axonal involvement on EMG, it will very likely progress to symptomatic myelopathy. We're almost over, Dr. Uh, Sleem. Uh, this was an actual case that presented to my clinic and symptoms resolved with thoracic epidural steroid injection. So take a moment to read my impression. Okay. Unfortunately, that is probably not how it's going to normally present to your clinic. The literature is full of case series where the pre presentation is non-dermatomal abdominal discomfort misdiagnosed as GI issues, such as irritable bowel. The literature is also very clear about the value of abdominal wall versus thoracic paraspinal needle EMG. And before you ask me, no, I haven't had to do abdominals because when I looked this up for this lecture, that's when I realized about the abdominal wall stuff. Otherwise, I was taught to look at thoracic paraspinals. So even though it is so rare, uh, it is worth mentioning. Um, and the causes are indeed board relevant for thoracic radiculopathy. So just to round out the picture of who I am, this is my family, my colleagues, my Bitmoji, 
the Optimus Prime costume I made for Comic-Con, me with Weird Al Yankovic and some silly stuff. Some of the nurses, some of you, sorry, some of um, the people who know me already know this side of me, but for the rest of you, this is just so you know that I'm a people person underneath all the official medical stuff. And I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. For, so now it's time for us to interact. Any thoughts about what you heard? It sounds like it's a similar thought felt by many non-interventional spine PM&R doctors throughout. I mean, it's in the literature. It just doesn't get it just doesn't get a bullhorn to it enough. You know what's happening though? As payers, meaning insurance companies, are realizing this stuff. You know, there's bundled payments. There's um, all different kinds of organizations that are coming. Slowly, we are going to matter more than surgeons. It's, I just know this because I'm in a private practice setting and that's what they're, they're thinking. They're thinking, hey, how can we get you guys seeing more of these patients than us so that they don't go to surgery so that our organization makes more because you save money. So the money we get, because if when it's procedure based, yeah, let's do as many procedures as possible. But if you really want to get them better, it's not because of surgery. I mean, it, surgery is important, but in certain situations. So yeah, you have very good company. Just know the literature. Don't get too um, passionately dogmatic without having good evidence to support it. Otherwise, you're just a car salesman. Let's yeah, I wanted to comment as well. I, I've been on. Uh, I've seen both sides of this where. Uh, I know some people that, you know, had uh, essentially failed, like really, really tried good friends who really, really tried and failed conservative management, got surgery and did great. And then I know people that uh, had very bad outcomes and similarly people who probably shouldn't have gone down that route. So you know, I, I'm interested in learning more about trying to really figure out the best candidates and really, um, you know, I agree that I think a lot of this stuff can be non-surgical, but recognizing that everything has its place in the world of medicine. Yeah. I mean, if you talk to IMDO, hear me roar, and by the way, I'm a huge proponent of osteopaths, but there are some that just become dogmatic. Like I said, craniosacral fixes everything. It's the same thing as, as surgeons, right? Nothing, or, you know, the latest, uh, the latest craze in um, PT around here is cupping. Like it's not gonna work on everything and it's not appropriate for everything, right? So whether it's surgery or one of these things, I feel the same way about them. It's just that surgery has a very strong advocacy arm in healthcare, whereas, it, and it's unbalanced, right? Second thing is when people say they've had conservative care, what have they had? When they've had PT, what have they had? When they had that thing, how did they do it? And I am kind of seen as like a, you know, um, I don't deserve this title, but like the expert in the community who can figure out what's going on with someone. You know why? Because I actually do a history and physical, that's it. It's the only reason, because I spend a lot of time and I don't make as much money as they do. So I get into the weeds. Then I had therapy and okay, okay, where did you have therapy? Where was it? Who did it with you? Okay, how many times a week? Uh, did you learn a home exercise program? Was it just passive or did you also have active? Are you still doing the home exercises? Why not? Which ones helped? Oh, it did help. Oh, and it would only last 10 minutes? Oh, but it helped. Oh, it lasted like, you know, it, it's there, it's in there that they, it, like it's like blood pressure medication if they don't take the medication their blood pressure doesn't get better and it's like well you know this ace inhibitor didn't work no it didn't they didn't take it right so sorry but most of you aren't going to do that you're going to gloss over it and figure out what interventions you can give quickly so you can get to the next patient and uh it sucks that's why i joined the va because i was like okay i'm going to be that guy who adds on that extra emg at seven o'clock doesn't get home to see his family wants to make more money you know, I knew that. So I put myself in a system where, you know, the incentive wasn't that. And now I'm good where I can, I've developed the right habits. But I have other friends who have been in private practice, are doing the right thing, know how to, you know, be efficient. And, and you know, I, I'm amazed by them. They didn't need to join the VA and take half and take a pay cut. <laughs> so that was my soapbox. Sorry. What else? Surgery is very important. And you're going to see slides about that but it's usually a sliver of the population that needs it. I think one of the things that we haven't had yet as a program is, you know, having the surgeons come and give us a talk. And I think we're on, there's a discussion about this now and saying like on which patients and like that they would offer surgery and whatnot. Like we see their notes, but we've never had a discussion with a neurosurgeon or orthospine proceduralist that- like, Be very oh. careful. 
be very careful. Your program director should pick someone. There's nine out of 10 surgeons that will tell you that thing needs surgery. And uh, there's one who says the evidence doesn't support it. Now you need that guy to come talk to you because he will be, to Patrick's point, the one who says, this, get him into the OR, I need to work on him, versus no, this is not surgically indicated because he hasn't been incentivized to do that. I know someone like that, he's my best friend. I'll, and he's like, dude, dude you, you talk to nine surgeons, they'd fuse this. This doesn't need it. You're, aren't you a physiatrist? That's what he said to me when I asked. It's like, Jesus, man, you're embarrassing me. But it gets scary sometimes. You see these disc herniations. I have a slide on that. So if you pick a surgeon, make sure you go in there. Just be careful, man, because you need to know their literature too. You need to know what goes wrong. You need to know, you know, what, what are these outcomes based on? Expert opinion, outcome studies, what? It's the same thing as PM&R. You need to know neuro's literature, neurosurgery's literature, PM&R's literature, not all of it. You don't need to know about deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's unless you're running a Parkinson's clinic, but don't be afraid to look at it. All right, let's keep going. This was awesome. Thank you for the questions and interrupt if something comes up. Um, should I move on, Sarah? Yep. Am I dog uh, is my dogma the same as yours or have I deviated a little? Yeah, pretty much. I was going to add my two cents. Uh, my, my two cents are pretty much that I think this is just a philosophy of medicine in general is that we're kind of taught cer certain things and physicians always are taught to do. They, we, it's very hard for physicians to not offer and do something that they've learned and, and that they've been trained on. It's extremely difficult, minus a uh, geriatrician, to not do or to take away. My dad um, uh, passed away in 2016, but prior to that, he was a psychiatrist and he did a lot of pain psychiatry too. So we had a lot of overlap and he told me about some quote, which I may be quoting wrong, but um, cure rarely, uh, treat often, care always. So you can cure a few things. If you can remove a tumor, um, um, uh, replete a deficiency, take away a toxicity or an infection. That's probably it that you can cure immediately, right? You can treat things and help the body get better, but there's a lot of patients that just need you to care. It's amazing. I feel like a, a quack sometimes because that's, that's all I'm doing for the patient sometimes is doing a good history and physical, giving them that report, explaining it to them, educating them. Do you guys know what the word doctor comes from? The Latin, docere to teach. So if you're not teaching your patient, you're not being a doctor. Anyway, this is what Sarah had to sit through when she had like six notes to write. So talk to me, what questions do you guys have? <laughs> I, I'm on the death star, uh, no, I'm on a destroyer, a star destroyer. <laughs> I guess I had a, a quick question about uh, hey, uh, spinal stenosis. Um, I always do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, because of the positioning in the supine for an MRI, it doesn't really show like axial loading. So I'm curious, like your, your thoughts on like a flexion extension, just uh, x-rays is helpful for diagnosing that? Okay, a lot to unpack there. So uh, do you mind keeping the, the camera on him so I can see yeah, how he's nodding? Or... Yeah, I like, to, I like to hide. I like to hide. So, so, so um, I, I have a lot to unpack in what you've said semantically. Yeah. So uh, first let me say, Flexion extension views are very important to me whenever there is any uh, spondylolisthesis mm -hmm. or this bilateral spondylolysis without listhesis. Um, and the reason is because I want to see, uh, statically it might look like this or statically it might look like this, but is this happening, right? Now, I've talked to enough neurosurgeons who are academic who will tell you that a certain amount of motion is normal. You're supposed to have motion in your spine. And the DOs will agree with that because they're constantly moving people's spines. Um, but uh, in the context of neurologic findings, it's very important to know how much motion is going on. If there is motion and um, there's neurologic findings, that person has to go to the surgeon. Now, if there's a little bit of motion, but no neurologic findings, watch it. That's it. Like. Let them know, hey, if you have any symptoms going down your legs, you know, all the all the red flag stuff. Yeah. Um, now, you're saying spinal stenosis with flexion extension views. So 
again, spinal stenosis is encroachment in the central canal or in the neuroforamina. And what I think you're getting at is the, the um, motion could be contributing to mechanically could be contributing to that overall picture of, you know, nerves being compressed. Yeah, that that could be the case. I don't know that that my clinical um, my clinical assessment of the patient would change a lot with now if they have neurologic findings. So cl if they have that clinical neuro neuro clinical um, uh, syndrome of of spinal stenosis, right? Which yeah. is really multi level ridic polyradiculopathy, causing them to when they're extended. You know, they're getting that shooting down shopping cart sign. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I could clarify my question. So say you have a patient presenting with uh, that. Um, there's a concern that they have maybe like uh, weakness bilaterals, some uh, pain patterns that are suggesting like a polyneuropathy. And then it's worse when they're extension. They're talking about how it's relieved when they're in flexion. Weakness. Sorry. Weakness. 100 percent. 100 percent with weakness. I would do it. Yes. 100%. If there's no weakness and they're just shooting down, I got to be honest, a lot of my veterans who I think they've got spinal stenosis, uh, they respond to treatment of mechanical low back pain. It's because not everything that radiates is neurologic. I have a couple slides on that. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think that if your gut is telling you I'm worried about motion, then you should you should get this flexion extension views. And I don't think they're looked at often enough personally. Um, if I know someone is eventually going to be referred for neurosurgery, I always get flexion extension views. Um, but I think a lot of this as a physiatrist comes down to your, um, history and physical to figure out whether you need to add that, you know, extra radiation at that point. Yeah. Thank you. I did I answer that? I don't feel like I answered it. I think you did. I think some of my uh, terms are still, uh, I'm still refining my, uh, definition. So thank you for going over that with me. No problem. Yeah, <laughs> and I would love to interact again. By the way, the bonus slides here they are, but you know they're they're all stuff that you know might might at one time I might have thought they were useful, but um, you know I I I think this was pretty focused. So let's um let's stop sharing this. <laughs> I thought it, I thought it was surprising that like the clinical um, presentation that like matches for ridic will often be negative on the electrodiagnostic study. And I'm wondering if, if that's because, like, are those cases more just like sensory radics or demyelinating? Like, are we, do we have this like whole like group of radiculopathies that we're like not seeing because we won't catch them on EMG? So. Yeah, this is a very good question. So um, I, let me just clarify though, that um, there are, there, there, there's evidence of corroborating symptoms, so history, there's evidence of corroborating exam findings and it's diff different specific findings and corroborating that with needle, right? So what you said is correct about history. Um, but in terms of exam, there is a high corroborative correlation uh, with um, uh, objective uh, weakness and reflex changes, sensory less so. So if you have those, it tends to correlate really well with electrodiagnostic findings. Is that clarify what you just asked? It does. Right. So now let's say, uh, th th then there was something about MSK. Remember that? So I said, if there's uh, MSK findings, that seems to correlate more with negative EMG, like not finding a radic on EMG. Okay. So that's so another that fact. I, I have to, uh, you know, he called bullshit on me. I'm yeah. going to just say it right away that I use Dr. Dillingham's, um, um, two monographs on, um, it was like AANEM position papers on, um, the, um, on radiculopathy, basically lumbosacral and cervical radiculopathy. I use that as a guide for presenting this. And there's a lot of things in here that, that are my own interest too, in terms of treatment, because I'm very pro physical therapy and, and I try to avoid injections and surgery as much. So I found a lot of literature on natural history of disc herniations and things like that. But if you go to those two monographs, all of it is in there. Everything that I've put in here, it's well established. This stuff is not, um, you know, obscure. It's, it, unfortunately, the physiatric community is not uh, as well versed in it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't know it. Like, even if you never do another EMG in your life, 
you should at least know that the guy you're sending uh, to uh, to do your EMGs, that when he gets these on needle, that is he doing six muscles? Do they include paraspinals? You know, um, is he calling fibs or is he calling polyphagia and, you know, uh, MUAP changes alone uh, for redict? These kinds of things are important for outcomes. Remember I showed you that slide that said your outcomes will be better for PT, uh, injections, or surgery if there's electrodiagnostic uh, abnormalities consistent with a redic. So it's important. It's clinically important. What else? And also, Sorry, we're discussing like the nuance between radiculitis and radiculopathy. I don't see that it's discussed very much. In terms of radiculitis, my understanding in terms of imaging, other than like, or at least when you have radiculitis secondary to the nuclear propulsus coming out of the disc, you can't really see that on imaging unless you're doing something like a discogram. Is that right? No, even a discogram isn't going to tell you it's radiculitis. What you have to do is you have to go in there and you have to biopsy and then you have to, you know, uh, measure for phospholipase and metalloproteinases and, and like, so what it is is that um, I hated that term. So as you saw, every, everywhere that crotchety old man was, those were all like slides I created because throughout residency and throughout being an attending, no one explained these things to me to my satisfaction because there's such gray areas, right? My my, like, what the hell is radiculitis? Why has someone put that on their uh, electrodiagnostic report? I found, I'll be honest, I think that people write that when they think clinically the person has a radiculopathy, but they didn't find it on electrodiagnostic testing or there's no, you know, um, abnormalities on physical exam. Um, but they think it's there. So they say L5 radiculitis. Or it could also be when you have like an unclear, people are thinking radiculopathy, but like the dermatomes aren't quite matching up. So then you have that nuclear propulsus causing a more generalized inflammatory response, irritating multiple nerves. Is that fair? Right. So that's what we're saying, right? We're saying that um, I don't have an MRI showing um, like a slam dunk disc herniation to explain it. There is something there, but it's not great. I don't have EMG findings, but when I epidural this guy, it did work. So retroact retrospectively, oh, he probably had a radiculitis. And by the way, radiculitis will go away on its own. That's what I tried to show you is that the natural history of um, disc herniations is resolution. You have to do surgery if the disc herniation is accompanied by progressive uh, paralysis, uh, you know, um, numbness and tingling, you know, saddle anesthesia, um, or they're just so severely um, affected by it that they can't. But most people get better. Most people will get better. But if you're trying to go into a field of injecting people all day long, I can understand. You want to offer them that that uh, benefit uh, yeah. of relief right away. Yeah, you want to discreet one nerve root. Yeah. <laughs> Radiculitis, I think it's really important to remember you need to treat it before it gets better. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, uh, I, Dr. Belosha, thank you so much for, for giving the talk. I'm, I have to jump off to go take little humans to a doctor's appointment, but, uh, but you guys keep asking them questions on a Star Destroyer. This is great. <laughs> Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. And thanks for connecting me with these guys. So what else? This is great because this, this why, what did you guys think of the spinal stenosis stuff? Did that clarify stuff for you? Because I found that immensely confusing as a resident. No, that's, really. that's, that's definitely helpful, especially um, spinal stenosis cause, it can cause multiple different things. You know, if it's, in, you know, can it be causing a myelopathy, can it be causing a radiculopathy? It's just, it's just saying it's narrowed in that point spot. Yes, so. yes. Instead right. of being a diagnosis, it's there, and it could be causing several different things. Correct. My my mentor still writes spinal stenosis in his um, electrodiagnostic reports. I don't do that. I write multi-level polyradiculopathy due to spondylotic um, <laughs> arthropathies, such as is seen with spinal stenosis. Now, that's very wordy, I know, but, <laughs> but I've covered myself to to not say that that's an electrodiagnostic finding. Spinal stenosis to me is not a electrodiagnostic finding, even though to him it is. Because a lot of our gurus in, in the literature used to say that. So, um, but I just think that it's better to be precise if you're going to have, if you have the ability to have that precision. Yeah, for, for, for us, our billers are very keen on that that is not a diagnosis. So just reinforce that for us. So. Really? Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, other question I had is how often, I mean, how, for the paraspinals, how quick are you to not check a paraspinal if they've had surgery before or epidural injections or some of these things that where it could technically cause there to be polyphagia or something with the paraspinals? Um, that's not necessary pathologic. Have you ever seen Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom? 
Yes. Yeah. That he, he goes and he just reaches into the guy's heart and pulls it out. You just you just did that. You just did that. Okay. <laughs> so I have I have definitely um, struggled uh, over the years. It's been an evolution. I've been struggling with this question because there's a part of me that is insanely thorough and comprehensive, but then there's another part of me that's learned. Don't go there. You may not like what you find. So. Um, here, let me just clarify what you're saying for those who may not follow. If you find, okay, so if you damage a muscle, you saw that slide where I said damaging yeah. a muscle, and this was done in a study where they basically took muscle biopsies. Uh, it, it, it was people that were going to have muscle biopsies. So what they did was they needled it before, then they biopsied it, and then they kept needling it for a long period of time. And they were able to see that after biopsy, you see positive sharp waves and fibs in that muscle continuing for a while. So what does that tell you? Someone who has an X fix or someone who had, you know, left mm -hmm. um done, they're probably going to have those positive sharp waves and fibs because of direct muscle damage. And what you're saying is, hey, I don't want to treat that as a false positive. Mm -hmm. So why even go there? Right. So uh, recommendations are that you're supposed to go a certain number of centimeters away from the midline incision, but that's not going to change that you're going into a muscle that's probably been damaged at some point. Uh, yeah. And so I used to say, oh, why even go there? Number two, you have old, I have tons of old guys who are coming in with spinal stenosis on their x-rays. Mm -hmm. I know if I needle them, I'm going to see positive sharp waves and fibs. So why bother? Okay, so now I've established why he's asking this question. Am I just going to see false positives? After uh, Dill Dillingham making the statistical uh, case for needing paraspinals, either do eight muscles in the lower limb or do six in the lower limb and do the paraspinals. And if you see something in the paraspinals, then you're going to end up doing more in the lower yeah. limb. So I have decided at this point that I am going to do the paraspinals every time radiculopathy is being asked for, which is, you know, I'm in a private practice where it's all injectologists and neurosurgeons who are like, is it L5 or is it L4? So, you know, for a long time, I was just doing five muscles in the limb and I was like, won't matter what I see in the paraspinals because I've done, you know, I don't see anything in the limb, so I'm not going to call it. But according to his um, multi-center trial, you have to do it. So I think you have to do it and then you have to put things in perspective. So if you see that a patient had an injury <clears throat> or they had surgery, then it's incumbent on you to include that as part of your differential when saying, however, the abnormalities could be due to um, direct muscle damage incurred during surgery. Um, if I see two um, in the lower limb or in the um, arm, and, and you know it's really obvious that this isn't coming from like a plexus injury or something like that, I may not do the paraspinals depending on time and whether the patient can tolerate it. I think you can say you should do the paraspinals in that case, just so you can show that it's proximal to the dorsal ramus. Um, but I do think that uh, if if I see stuff in the paraspinals and that's it. And I've done my due diligence of checking other nerves in the um, lower limb or the upper limb. Then I will say, um, I have this verbiage that I use. It's like uh, um, abnormalities in a single muscle um, do not meet minimal criteria for a nerve lesion. Um, and then if it's only one muscle in the paras and that muscle is in the paraspinals, then I'll say abnormalities in the paraspinals alone uh, can be indicative of um, underlying uh, dorsal root, sorry, dorsal uh, primary. Dorsal primary ramus lesions, uh, multi-level spinal stenosis, uh, or paraneoplastic disease. Um, uh -huh. As, as that's, that's what I say to cover myself. Um, yeah, so it's, if you asked me five years ago, I would have said something very different. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. That's good. No, thank you so much. You're welcome.